To the average American of 1800, the West was a void, a black land of desolation, from whence no man foolhardy enough to march into it might return. But two Americans did lead a party into the bleakness, setting down the facts of the wilderness, binding the continent from ocean to ocean with the truth. These leaders were Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Together, they unveiled America's destiny. William Clark was born in 1770 in Albemarle County, Virginia. Following in the footsteps of his older brother, George Rogers Clark, conqueror of the revolutionary Northwest, William Clark became a lieutenant in the Army of the United States. Meriwether Lewis was born in 1774 at Locust Hill, the family plantation, which was not far from the home of Thomas Jefferson. As a youngster, Lewis loved to ramble about in the wilderness. Both Lewis and Clark served under General Anthony Wayne, who trained his troops to a fine point for wilderness fighting. In 1800, Thomas Jefferson, then President of the United States, appointed Captain Lewis to be his personal secretary. Full salutation, Lewis. You know, you, uh, you've been most melancholy these past few days, my boy. I didn't realize that. Oh, you didn't realize that I, uh, I hadn't forgotten that little plan of ours. Tell me, Lewis, do you think it's really possible that there are prehistoric mammoths out there? Out where, Mr. President? Why, out west, of course. Beyond the Mississippi, in the Emperor Napoleon's territory. I've heard that a huge mountain of pure salt lies out in that wilderness. You may be the first white man to ever see that wonder. Mr. President, you mean the expedition? Yes, Lewis. Finally, the expedition to the west. You love to take long walks by yourself in the forest. I mean for you to have your fill of them. You can't know what this means to me. Not half of what it can mean to your country, Lewis. Your job will be to command a corps of discovery to find the best land route to the Pacific. You will map the land's topography, and note its plant, animal, and mineral resources. You will bring this government into touch with the Indians of the West and help divert the fur trade. But, Mr. President, the land belongs to France. Not for long, I hope. And most of the trade is being done by the British from Canada. We'll take it from the British and divert it down the Missouri River to St. Louis. That's why your party will travel up the Missouri and find its source. Oh, by the way, Lewis, do you know any hardy souls who might go with you? Particularly a man to share your command? Well, there's a Moses Hook, lieutenant in the infantry. He's a good man. But Billy Clark, the old redhead, there's a natural leader for you. And none better when it comes to maps and sketching. Not uh, George Clark's brother. <laughs> uh, with one of those Welshmen with you, you needn't worry about a hairy mammoth. It'd turn tail and run for its life. <laughs> Jefferson prevailed upon Congress to appropriate the sum of $2,500 for the purpose of extending the external commerce of the United States. And in 1803, Lewis and Clark began to mold a group of 37 men into a corps of discovery. While Lewis set about purchasing supplies, Clark trained the small force at Camp River Dubois, near the mouth of the Missouri River. Now, Shannon. There's your musket, cleaned. Now you clean mine. Captain Clark, sir, I don't think I'll ever get it right. Captain, sir, might I be taking young Shannon and whacking with the by private like a dirt dead soldier? Very well, Paddy. Yes, sir. Come on, me by. Old Paddy will see you finish your lesson. Captain Bill, Captain Billy, Captain Lewis is here. He says send him in to help him unload supplies. He said, hurry, hurry. All right, York, all right. Ryer, Ordway, Juilliard. Captain Billy, Captain Sir, that fool Captain Lewis done brought all matter of fool thing with him from St. Louis. Mern, how are you? Sure good to see you back. Did you see them transfer the territory at St. Louis? Oh, that I did. First from Spain to France, then from France to the United States. All in a matter of two days. Very formal, but the land is ours. Yahoo! Jefferson did it. The Corps of Discovery won't need passports now. That's Yankee land, and all for $15 million. The Louisiana Purchase. And uh, what did the captain bring back this time to overload the boats and break our backs on the trails? 
Oh, mostly Indian presents this time. Tomahawks, red flannel, combs, butcher knives. Four dozen of them. Eight and a half pounds of red beads. And 73 bunches of assorted beads. 15 dozen scissors. 2,800 assorted fish hooks. Just a few odds and ends. I know, I know. One of the most important missions of this journey is to make a good impression on the Indians. Fill up a happy trade with them. And to keep the men happy, I managed to bring our total supply of whiskey up to 30 gallons. That should get us well started. By the way, Captain Lewis, I got a letter from the war office. Mm, good, they finally got around to recommissioning you as a captain. Not as a captain, as a lieutenant in the artillery. What? Look here, Mern, you said we'd be co-commanders on this campaign. Well, that's the way I've always spoken of it. That's the way the men think of you. You just as much authority as I, Billy, and that's the way it stays. Captain, with quotation marks around it, eh? I picked you, Billy, because I knew you could lead. I'm depending on you, Captain. You've got the confidence of the men. Together, as co-commanders, we'll get to that Western Ocean and back again. Agreed? Agreed. By the way, how's the work coming with the boats? Oh, very well. The bateau's almost finished, the two pirogues are ready and waiting. May 14th, 1804. The Lewis and Clark expedition started up the wide Missouri. It moved upstream through the last outposts of white man civilization. And by October, the party had reached a point 50 miles north of modern day Bismarck, North Dakota. Lewis and Clark selected this site for winter quarters. Here they built Fort Mandan and waited, waited for the spring. And here they found Charbonneau, a Frenchman, and his wife, Sacagawea, a Shoshone Indian girl. Merci. Say it, Squaw. Merci. That's enough, Squaw, man. Oh, but of course, Capitaine. <laughs> Still, Charbonneau does not understand. She is but a squaw. Among the Indians, she is less than nothing. At the most, uh, property. <laughs> and Sacagawea owes me much. <laughs> she is a captured Shoshone girl. Who knows what might have happened to her if it had not been for me. A loving husband. <laughs> but I am a weak man that cannot stand to see Southway. Her body is covered with the marks of your beatings. Oh, well, I, uh, I have shortcomings. But as you have said, I might be valuable to you as uh, an interpreter. Still, I don't know. I don't like to be tied down. Perhaps some uh, little incentive. Uh, say $25 or... a month. Oh, Captain Louis, that is a very fine affair. <laughs> you hear, Sacagawea? Twenty-five dollars a month. <laughs> How valuable is your husband, no? <laughs> your wife will accompany us, Charbonneau. She'll be able to interpret for us when we reach the land of the Shoshones. Oh, very, very true. Very true indeed. She can row and carry, and uh, she can stand very much. <laughs> no, no, little pomp. What's the trouble, huh? Don't you worry, Sack... Sack... Uh, I'm gonna call you Janie. Don't you worry, Sack... Don't you worry. We're gonna fix up Pomp in no time. Yes, we better take good care of him while we can. Next winter, instead of bringing people into the world, we may be ushering them out. Spring, 1805. The Corps of Discovery started again up the Missouri. Next stop, the Pacific Ocean. Every foot of the way was set down by William Clark. Every object of interest, everything that went to make up this vast new land was noted carefully by Meriwether Lewis. And every stroke of the oar seemed to enrage the Missouri. They would not be denied. They made the boats move, always upstream, always ahead. When they needed smaller craft, they hollowed canoes out of the forests. Every new mark on the map was etched in hardship, anxiety. Courage. They put names on the land and waters, past Maria's River, onto the Great Falls, and then to the dilemma of the Three Forks. They called them the Gallatin, Madison, and Jefferson Rivers, and went up the Jefferson Fork, coming in sight of the great mountains that divide a continent, the Rockies. Here they met the first Indians since leaving the Mandans in spring. They were hopeful of aid. I told you, Jenny, there would come in handy when we found the Shoshones. I'm amazed Sacagawea can still talk to her people. She certainly wasn't any help when it came to finding their villages. How's your rheumatism, Billy? Well, it'll be fine if Janie can talk Kamiyawait into giving us some horses and some help getting over those mountains. 
What's she talking about, Charbonneau? Well, uh, Charbonneau does not understand Shoshone talk. But I told her to uh, tell the chieftain about the great white father to the east, the uh, blessings of the white man's trade, the usual... Uh... I'm beginning to feel like a drummer selling his wares. Every time we sit down with the Indians, it's the same sales talk over again. Drewyard's outside giving the braves gifts. It should have a big effect with this tribe. They've never seen a white man before or a firearm of any sort. And the Shoshones are a hungry bunch. And no match for the Blackfeet. They don't even get their fair share of buffalo. If they could trade with the states, they'd have a chance to prosper and... Charbonneau, what's the matter? No! Sacre de Nome! It is not possible! <laughs> what are you talking about? Gentlemen, I am the Uzbanta royalty. Sacre you up, you will not believe this. Long ago, she was kidnapped, as you know. But she did not know or remember her position. She is the sister to the chieftain, Kamaiwe. <laughs> Why, well, then Janie can get us what we want. Oh, we? Oui. No, no. Although Kamaiwe will probably do as she asks, she has no real standing. But she's his sister. Set them all. But Sakajui is still only a squaw. With the help of Sakajui's tribe, the party obtained horses and guidance. Up, up, and over the Rocky Mountains. They found the beginnings of the river that could carry them downstream, down to the Pacific. The men were heartened. The rest of the journey would be downhill. But difficult as the journey up the Missouri had been, it was nothing to the harrowing trip down these roaring cataracts. Through the country of the Nez Perce, down Snake River into the Columbia, down Homley Rapids, past Mount Adams and the Cascades, and out, out to the ocean. Yes, there came the day when William Clark wrote in his journal, Ocean in View. Winter, 1805. The Corps of Discovery on the Pacific shore near the mouth of the Columbia River. Fort Clatsop was built, and the men waited. I say marry her, Billy. What? Judy Hancock, marry her. Much better than naming Rivers after. An honor she may never hear of. I'll marry her. And name Rivers after her. You're an incurable optimist, Billy. Uh, there'll be a ship along any day now to pick us up. The president knows it's about Do you time. really expect a ship? No. It's been deadly dull for months. Not enough happening. No tobacco, no meat. Fort Clatsop. Clatsop. Have you ever heard a name with fewer possibilities than Clatsop? Don't worry. You won't be here much longer. I've started planning a trip back home, on foot. But we haven't any horses. That's what I said, on foot. Private Shannon reporting, sir. Relieved of the watch. What do you have to report, Shannon? Nothing, sir. And a great deal of it, I might add. You can take a report back to the men for us. Tell them, so far, the trip has been easy. If they can stay alive during the walk back home again, then they've passed the real test. March 23rd, 1806, the Corps of Discovery walked away from the Pacific Ocean. Its goal, the Atlantic. Back, back they toiled along the Columbia and over the Rockies. Clark took one party down the Yellowstone River to further explore and map possible routes of travel. Lewis took another party on toward the Missouri. At the juncture of the Yellowstone and Missouri, the parties met and continued to Fort Mandan. Only 1,600 miles to St. Louis. But back at Locust Hill, Meriwether Lewis' mother received a caller, an old neighbor and good friend. Lucy, I have a conscience that's been bothering me about your son and about yourself. Have, have you heard anything definite? Nothing, only that Indian rumor has it that the party was last seen crossing the Rocky Mountains, heading for the ocean to the west. That news, who knows how old it is. Well, now believe me, Mr. President, I hold no false hopes. You know, Lucy, those two young men aren't the first I've sent to pry the lid off the wilderness. But in this case, I, I feel I've sent men very dear to me. And to what fate? Torture, starvation, death. Did I do wrong, Lucy, to send your young man? No, Tom. 
you gave Meriwether and William a chance for greatness. A chance to make their country great. Thank you, my dear. And may God prove all our fears to be foolish. For if Lewis and Clark are on their way home, they'll travel faster than rumor itself. Listen to them, Mern. They sound happier than we do. St. Louis, Billy. They've got a right to be happy. It's all over. No more rotted elk skin clothing. No more choked cherry root medicine. No more core of discovery. We did it, Mern. And now I'm going to get married. Judy Hancock, here I come. I'll go on to Washington and present our reports to President Jefferson. I just can't believe it. Look here, Mern. It's all over but the shouting. What we did only needs doing once. Thank heaven. It is together that we remember Lewis and Clark. For together they unveiled America's destiny and strengthened the claim of the United States to the Pacific Northwest. Neither could have done it alone.